The Raven's Flock presents The Black Files, an uncensored interview and review podcast for all geek fandom. Welcome everybody, friends and pals, guys and gals, boys and girls around the world. Pop a squat, hop open a cold one with all of your friends. It is Monday. We are starting off a brand new week, the first full week of October. And yes, your ears are not deceiving you. You are listening in to a brand new episode of The Black Files. All right. Fantastic. It has been forever ago since we've had an episode. Yeah, it's been since the beginning of the quarantine. It's been six months without a fresh episode of The Black Files. But thankfully... Your, your 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 esteemed host, myself, uh, Quan Arouse, one of the heads of the Ravens Flock, is bringing you a brand new episode of our uncensored interview and review podcast. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm Juan Arouse, one of the heads of the Ravens Flock, the host of this program, and I have in studio with me uh, to my immediate left, the host of Los Amigos Play, Angel Mendez. Always happy to be here. All the way on the f- from the land of scarcity. Yep, all the way on the far end here, I've got Jose Casabona, the head of the Ravens Flock. How you, go- how you doing, folks? Folks, happy to start off the week of happy to start off the month of October with the Black Files. And uh, joining us via Zoom is a friend of the Ravens flock here. It's only Sarah. How you doing? Hi, good to be here. Excellent. Glad to have you here. Thank you for joining us. And um, on this sp- uh, special episode, uh, we're going to uh, do something that we haven't really done in a little while, um, which is kind of a joke because we do this shit all the time. Uh, we're going to be talking about professional wrestling. <laughs> Specifically, we're going to be discussing the interesting history of Turner uh, Network Television um, and its uh, and its relationships with World Championship Wrestling, and now with uh, All Elite Wrestling. Uh, it's it, it has been a really weird up and down journey. Jose has been doing a lot of research here for us on this one. Absolutely. Uh, Sarah's got some questions in on this and we're giving uh, all of your uh, uh, listening in and Angel uh, an education here on like the highlights and lowlights of uh, professional wrestling on this particular cable channel. You'll part of you'll part of the pun, but we're going to be showing Angel the ropes. Indeed. I'll be the first to admit that I am some water bay neophyte in this bizarre world of angry sweaty men slamming each other onto the ground. Don't look at my internet history. But I am always happy to get some education from those who know a thing or two about the kind of world that that is. Because I won't lie, my, my love with wrestling has always been with Lucha. You know, I love the theatrics a little more than I love whatever the hell's going on on Western TV right now. But I'm always happy to hear more from the people that have been around this a lot longer than I have and know about it a lot more than I have. Absolutely. And it's important to note that right now on this recording that we are actually past uh, October 3rd, which uh, marks the 31st anniversary, uh, anniversary of the inception of Turner Network Television and yeah. October 2nd being the one year anniversary of AEW Dynamite, which yep. airs Wednesday nights on TNT. Yep, and uh, for those of you who are big fans of professional wrestling, of course, this la- this past week was a momentous occasion. Uh, those of you who like the old school style of Jim Crockett promotions and World Championship Wrestling, you probably had yourself a nice little blast. If not, you probably didn't notice enough to give a shit. And to, before we go any further, uh, as we usually do on this program, we inform you this is an uncensored interview and review podcast. That means that we will be swearing like motherfuckers. We are expressive, and we don't actually mean anything by it but if we do we'll let you know we uh, don't you, I, like i said if we do we'll let you know so like we swear like I'm, fucking sailors i may have to write some apologies after this is over <laughs> like you ever apologize for anything i said i'm gonna write them i never said i was gonna send them good point <laughs> just put them in your dice wall like and <laughs> michael jordan wow and of course of course uh, uh, we also have uh spoilers for any sort of programming or movies or books or tv shows or anything that we may be discussing so if we spoil you on something uh sorry not sorry uh and also we will also we will be expressing opinions that may or may not clash with your worldview everyone's got different opinions angel and i have terrible back and forths on our facebook messenger pages it's all uh, shit about you know anti-communism and destruction of the proletariat and shit and we have those th- th- those discussions in good form and good fashion, and it's always with nothing but sportsmanly discussions and debate in mind. But of course, if you ha- are the kind of person who can't handle an opposing worldview, and if you think that you're completely right in the entire world and you cannot 
open yourself up to new ideas or experiences. Go watch something else. Go kindly fuck off and listen to something else. Please be aware that we do not aim to cause conflict for the sake of conflict. We aim to cause debate for the sake of education. We do not hate you. We just think a lot less of you. That's all. <laughs> but of course, if you're willing to open your mind up to us. And I agree with us unconditionally 100% of the time. Yeah, God damn it, man. No, oh, if you're God. willing to go ahead and open up to us, open your mind and open your heart to us, then please, we invite you to continue listening in. We invite you to express yourself with us uh, by either commenting on the uh, program on any one of our uh, podcast cha- uh, 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 distributors, which is on Spotify, uh, iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. Uh, or you can check us out on our video uh, version on our YouTube channel or on Facebook or wherever else the hell you're going to listen to this thing because, quite frankly, we're everywhere. <laughs> we are everywhere. You can't stop us. Can't stop, won't stop. Exactly. I'm spreading this shit like butter. To be fair, though, due to the basic advancements of social media, everyone is everywhere all the time, especially when they don't want to be. Ever. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's like, uh, wait, wait which, which, which credit card is it? It's everywhere you want to be? We, we like. <laughs> The credit card companies are everywhere I want to be. That's for sure. I, I don't remember. Well, the no, po- the point not, is we're happening. we're everywhere. We're everywhere. You don't want us, whether you want us there or not. We know where you are, and you we're know we're everywhere it. that we want to be. That's true. Oh, I it's Visa. There we go. Freaking Visa. Now I remember. Visa. Oh yeah. Well, why can't I be happy again? Because you're not everywhere you want because to be. Because you didn't yet. order McDonald's. God damn it, <laughs> Angel. All right. So yeah. enough wench. I do not wish to be hungry anymore. Uh, I just want to be happy. Why are you calling Jose a wench? We've got a lady he's friend. Kind of a hoe sometimes. I love him like a <laughs> brother, but he's kind of a hoe sometimes. All right, so, all right. Okay, all right. let's get let's get down to it. Jose, why don't you start this tale off with us? Since this entire little celebration idea was yours. Yeah, absolutely. Daddy, tell me and a story. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, daddy, tell me more. I want to know. Daddy killed his child. He came out wrong. I didn't know Elmo was here. Yay! Elmo <laughs> said, "Daddy, it's like it was a story." I can wait. Yeah. I've got all day. Helium Jar Jar Binks have arrived. This bad guy has to go straight to shit real quick. Oh, wow. Sarah, I am so sorry you had to witness this, but we're going to have to kill him after this is over. Uh, Joke's right. on you. I'm the one with the freaking the hand tools here. You're going to have to try something be- better than that. I will choke you down with All right, guys. Let's Bring cut it out. <laughs> I'm going to cut something out. Believe that. All you right. ain't using it. All right, all right, all right. Let's put the tools down. All right. Fine. So. It's not tool time anymore. First of all, we <laughs> do, first of all, we do have to congratulate All Elite Wrestling with their success. Uh, one year airing on TNT with AEW Dynamite, and they have certainly lived up to the expectations, not just to their own, but to the fans and to the executives of Turner Network Television. Their success has already earned them a contract extension up to 2023 with another provision that they're working on a second show it, that's – Still in progress. No news uh, updates yet, but it's part of the provisions for the contract extension. So, hey, kudos on them. Yay. Okay. So, but it's just... important to talk about it but, but when we first have to go into the history of back in the old days. Is it time for flashbacks, boys? Yes, it is. You're never too young to have a Vietnam flashback. Back in my heyday with all these goddamn ah. n- <laughs> All right. I'm, cut his, I'm cutting your mic. That's it. Cut his mic. I'm cutting, I'm cutting it. Listen to me. Nope. 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 Mic's cut. Nope. You are on timeout. <laughs> it's okay, children. I took my meds again. Okay. Anyways. Okay, All right. Let's get to this shit. So, yeah. Angel turned into a 60-year-old fart the moment he put that that hat on. Jose, take your hat back. Thank you. I need What's to going on? Head. There um, you go. What All am right. I doing here? I don't know. We're talking about wrestling. Just bear with us. Uh, Anyways, so, okay. of course, when it comes to Turner Network Television, you also have to mention the man behind it in the same breath. That is billionaire Ted Turner, the founder of Turner, uh, of Turner Network of TNT and TBS. Well, Turner Media, basically. Not yep. just founder of that. Mr. Turner has had hands in many different business ventures. In fact, many people consider him to be somewhat of a modern equivalent of, of a renaissance man. The man's business percents seems to be impeccable. It's the he has had his hand on like more oh, development for like uh, broadcast technology and uh, getting himself set up in like the early days of cable television. Mm-hmm. You have to remember, ca- like for those of you who were born on this end of the of, of the millennium, cable TV used to be a very beautiful thing. It was very big, that's for sure. Number one, it, it, number one, there was no commercials. Period. Number two, it was pricey as hell. But <laughs> was no, I, I'm saying I'm <laughs> saying relatively like we're talking about like the early 80s when when Fair cable enough. TV started. It was debuting essentially, and 
the real kicker on this was at number C is that uh, you the channels that were coming out were very very niche channels. Uh, it, the 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 joke that we all have about MTV is not without merit. Like I, I see Sarah smiling over here. She's like, you got. I'm I'm sure you got something to say about that. Yeah, well, like when they used to play music and you actually used to have music on the channel. Yeah. yeah, it was it was a wonderful thing. They called it music television for a freaking reason because they would literally load the ch the the channel with back to back music videos. Yes, of the performers and these music videos were made specifically and produced by the record companies to promote these songs and these singles from bands all over the world. Now, and now it's then, just a you know, evolution ground. happens. Yeah, now it's just a dumping ground for reality shows. It, it It's not even a good dumping ground for reality shows either. Is there but, such a thing as a good reality show? Or did we all just fool ourselves into thinking we wanted to see it because we missed soap operas? No, the, the thing is that the, like reality shows in and of themselves, when ah. they first got started, it w there was uh, a point of it where there was like, okay, well, this is a niche and this is something interesting. But when... As corporations normally do, they see something, they see they make that it makes money, they replicate it, and they replicate it ad nauseum. And before you know it, the History Channel was loaded with shit like Pawn Stars. Oh. And speak and uh, back uh, going back on the subject of history, yes, it is important to know that Ted Turner has had in his hands on many ventures, but more importantly, he colorized the moon. Yes, uh, that's his family. The I joke for you. But the, in the interest of this podcast, it's important to know that Ted Turner is also a passionate fan of professional wrestling. He held it very close to his heart, and he is devoted to professional wrestling. He and, was. In fact, um, around the same year in 1988, um, uh, Ted Turner actually purchased out Jim Crockett Promotions and renamed it into WCW World Championship Wrestling and allowed it to continue to air on the Superstation every Saturday night at 6.05. On, t on TBS. Birth of it. That's yeah. right. Specifically on TBS, uh, on the TBS station, TNT wasn't uh, uh, on yet at that point, was it? A uh, little fact. According to both his fans and his detractors, Ted is known as the voice of the South. Whether this is said in good or bad spirit, well, that depends on who's saying it. Well, the Turner, ne well, the Turner Network television station, isn't it located in Atlanta, Georgia? That's I was about to say, it's in Atlanta. It yeah. is in Atlanta. So it does make sense. Yeah. Oh, by the way, <laughs> thank I, you. By the way, I apologize for Segway. Remember a few years ago when I told you I couldn't remember the last music song I ever heard on MTV? I finally found it. What was it? It's a "Good Is Good" by Sheryl Crow. Well, really? That was the last song I ever saw in MTV with a surprisingly trippy-looking <laughs> music video. Wow. Good is Bless good you. by Sheryl Crow. Please tell me that Crow. was a sneeze because I didn't saw your face move and I don't know where that noise came from and I'm freaking out right now. Hey, you'll oh, be fine. No, I just moved. Laptop, sorry. All right. But back to it then. Mr. So, Turner so loves the wrestling. Be before you, uh, before Jim, uh, uh, before Jim Crockett Promotions was actually bought up, and this is something that I needed to bring up here earlier. Uh, you said it was bought out by Ted Turner in 1988. In 1984, uh, the reason why it was uh, it was bought up is because four years prior, um, Jim Crockett Promotions was airing uh, its own programming uh, it, it, on TBS uh, it, uh, on WTBS as Georgia Championship Wrestling. And on July 14th of 1984, Vince McMahon's WWF, the World Wrestling Federation, had actually taken over the weekly uh, time slot on that station. They like The professional wrestling circles actually call that Black Saturday because <laughs> on this very hyper-Southern TV station that oh was goodness. broadcasting... Almost uh, like it was right at the verge of broadcasting nationwide. They get their they get their favorite wrestlers co opted by what they call the cartoon wrestlers out of New York. And oh, this is the horrible thing, the oh, worst thing geez. ever. You think that the uh, that arguments about uh, which character in Super Smash Brothers was bad? Oh, Imagine boy. this shit back in the eighties. It was terrible. What do you mean you there put were this riots. wrestling in the roster? What the hell? No, no, wrong no. With you? They put they put the quote unquote the wrong kind of wrestling. Oh How my do you goodness. Do wrong wrestling. Do you pull out a gun and just shoot your opponent? No, there's you have to understand there's very specific styles when yeah. it comes to professional wrestling I, I'm and when it comes I know there's technical style and show off style. It's more the presentation. Uh. You you have to understand like southern wrestling, like like mid south and southern professional wrestling was presented more hard knocking, more realistic, more athletic competition. Whereas the boys up by in the north and the WWF, like Vince McMahon was all about 
the pizzazz and the showmanship the and spectacle having, versus the performers. Exactly. Like uh, yes. Like more about the name value of Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage rather than having guys who are like athletically trained for proper competition like you would have had with Ric Flair or Harley Race. Uh, just to name a few the mm-hmm. guys who made uh, like NWA and, and Jim Crocker promotions made those promotions as big as they were on athletic merit rather than marketing. That makes sense. So essentially the Southern wrestling looks down upon Northern wrestling because they believe Southern wrestling doesn't have the chops to actually do proper wrestling. You, it's the other way around. Oh, really? I thought the North were the ones that were based on spectacle. Yeah, no. The, 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 okay, yeah. I'm, get, I'm getting everything mixed up. Yes, the, the North is one that, uh, that was based on spectacle, and the South and you know, Southern wrestlers don't respect the WWF because of that. Exactly. All you got is and image. You ain't got no techniques. Exactly, so. and as a result of that shit, in order to avoid having to deal with this monstrosity happening, that's what wound up uh, having Ted Turner buy Jim Crockett promotions outright and just place it on his own fucking channel. Like, I'm not going to b- bother with either of you guys. Screw you both. You're both it's like, I don't care how much money you're throwing at me. Just, I'm going to fucking put this out. And this is the, uh, this is my company now. This is my promotion. And I'm going to fucking put it out on my channel. So screw all you. Literally rode in on a wave of money and washed away the problem. Oh yeah, absolutely. Pretty much. Yeah. As long as Ted Turner was in charge of his own, of his own, uh, of his own station, WCW would always have a home. Remember that sentence, folks. It is important. Because all good things must come to an end. But we'll get to the end in a few we'll minutes. We'll get to the end. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Between then and around 1994, you know, they were still struggling to try to improve the quality of the product for WCW on national television and trying to attract viewers. And not to say that there was any wrestlers that weren't popular back then. I mean, shoot, they had good names, like as Juan mentioned, Ric Flair. They had, um, they they also had the icon known as Sting. They had v- Vic Van Vader. They had good re- names in WCW. But, but when you compare them to the names of, the and w- I have to say it, the WWF, such as Hulk Hogan, Bret the Hitman Hart, the Ultimate Warrior. There is a reason those men's images last even today, despite the sheer amount of controversy their lives have carried on them. Uh, yes. Whether you like it or not, their memories are etched onto human culture. But b- regardless of the uh, regardless of the fact, Ted Turner still had hopes. His executives, not so much. Which is why they pushed uh, for Ted Turner to actually have his company um, open negotiations with by far the biggest wrestling pr- star on the face of the planet. And in what year did he make his spectacular debut? You said 1994? 1994, which yep. was around the time that uh, WCW and Turner Executives hired executive producer Eric Bischoff, who helped turn everything around for WCW. He started off by, ha- having, uh, th- uh, by having WCW programming move to TNT and to produce weekly live broadcasts, and thus WCW's Monday Nitro was born. And at that point, that helped out because the TNT channel had just gotten started at that point. That's right. So this is a big thing. This is a big promotion. Yay. Hey, check this out. We've got a new Fangled Dangle show over here. It's And it's live. You never know what's going to happen. And yep. along the same time, they also wound up signing Hulk fucking Hogan to their promotion at that point. And it was a big deal. It was like a, a gigantic grab. Hulk Hogan was just getting fresh out of his contract with the WWF expiring. And it didn't help that at the same time Vince McMahon and the WWF were facing their steroid allegation trials at which Hulk Hogan uh, sat to testify. And, of course, his testimony soured his relationship with Vince McMahon and they parted ways. But the moment that happened, WCW and Eric Bischoff basically scooped him up. Yep. In fact, it was Eric Bischoff who convinced Turner executives and WCW executives to bring Hulk Hogan into WCW and to actually um, a- a- spend a little bit more money on the quality of the product. Hence, as Juan mentioned, the birth of WCW Monday Nitro, which aired in 1995. Can you imagine what it must be like for somebody watching TV? Please take into account, this is long, long before the existence of the online service as popular as it is today. This happened when I was born, 1988, by the way. Mm-hmm. That, oh, Jesus Christ. I well, coincide with the well we, move, we move forward on the timeline. We're in 1995 now. I know. I'm getting there. Point in case is, imagine how this must be for the average wrestling fan, knowing that they're getting so much content piled upon them at such incredible speed. I'm going to ahead and assume that must have been like the beginning of the golden times at that point. Oh, no. It was. 
Oh, no. WCW and Turner would hit their highest point in the following year in 19, in the summer of 1996 with oh. the birth of the New World Order. That oh, was now that's a word I'm familiar with. That was, uh, I, I don't know how, how fluent you are on this, Sarah, how much you know about the NWO faction. Uh, New World Order. New World um, World a little bit. A little bit? Okay, in that yeah. case, you're getting a history lesson, too. At the pay-per-view event for WCW, Bash at the Beach, leading up to this event, Two other wrestlers from the WWF, Kevin Nash, who wrestled under the name Diesel, and Scott Hall, who wrestled under the name of Razor Ramon. Their contracts had lapsed out. They signed to uh, WCW, and the way they came on board, they were making the illusion that they were their WWF characters, that they were coming in and that they were invading WCW. They weren't going by their actual names yet. They weren't... Uh, they, they were going very hard on the fact, like, okay, you guys want to call us outsiders because we're coming in and we're trashing your place? Well, just w wait until you see us, uh, me and Kevin Nash, and our third man, our th our third inside man, who you're never going to find out who he is until we say he's right. We're going to come and we're going to run roughshod on WCW, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. And thus, this was met in the form of a six-man tag team match, three men against three men. You had... Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and their third mystery man who hasn't shown up yet against was it the who Macho was it? Man Randy Savage, Ooh. Sting, and Lex Luger, the total package. Yep. The, <coughs> those three guys, they were coming in defending like the honor of WCW. And just as the match was uh, was going on and it looked as if there was a turning point for the WCW guys, um, Hulk Hogan walked down to the ring. Everyone knows who he is. He's always fighting for good guys. He's always, you know, the real American flag waving. He's everybody. He fucking knocks out uh, uh, Randy Savage. He fucking drops his leg on Randy Savage, reveals himself as the third man. And after, like, this winds up shocking every fucking buddy. It wasn't and that the point where the crowd actually went silent for, like, one solid second? The crowd actually... Screaming their heads off. Yep. When that leg came down with the force of a meteor. Yes. It was it was terrible. It, it, the it, crowd it was, erupted. It was so bad that the crowd started throwing trash into the <laughs> ring. Oh, my gosh. And... What's more, the referee was thrown out, so just to mock the entire thing, Scott Hall went down, and he's the one who counted the three pin, and then obviously, <laughs> like, it doesn't count because he's not the referee. They threw the WCW guys out the ring, and they were interviewed by Gene Okerlund, who asked him, what is the meaning of all this, Hulk Hogan? Why would you turn your back on the fans, and why would you turn your back on WCW? His infamous first words on this, well, you got it. First of all, Mean Gene, if you want to hear what I got to say, you better tell all these people to shut the hell up. For two years, I've done all the photo shoots. I've done all the promotions and the charities. And quite frankly, brother, I'm bored. I was offered millions of dollars. I was offered world caliber oh, matches. And quite frankly, I'm sick and tired of these fans not appreciating the work I do, which is why I'm running with my friend Kevin Nash and my friend Scott Hall. You can call us the new world order of wrestling, brother. Oh. And that... Oh, that shit. fiery promo which blew everyone's mind it was like it, you have to understand like the this was good, history in the making the, the goody two shoes hulk hogan that everyone had known and loved has started growing stale so this idea was the brainchild of eric bischoff and hulk hogan and they were like okay if we're going to turn hulk hogan into a bad guy this needs to be a big fucking deal let's have him be the secret third man of the new world order and for two years straight, the NWO faction ran roughshod all over the company for good and for ill. I'll, you, you're pro you've got a weird, confused look over here, Sarah. I'm, you're probably no, I'm just listening. Oh, okay. Because I was about to say, like, the reason why we're saying for good and for ill is because, like, what did we mention earlier that corporations do? When they see something successful like reality TV, what do they do? They exploit that shit until every single until all the drop of blood has been coming out of the stones is finished drying. Abs yeah, they wind up like with the unlimited bankroll of Eric of uh, of Ted uh, of Ted Turner. Eric Bischoff kind of got big in the head, and the faction of the New World Order ballooned and swelled up to almost what? How many people at its peak? Like Too what, many people. It like, was like 50 guys in the New World Order. It was diluted. It was... That's a lot of dudes in you, the New World Order. There's no argument was, to the fact that the New World Order did help WCW and Turner Network uh, and TNT a lot in terms of generating revenue, in terms of generating pay-per-view buy rates, getting a lot of eyes on the product, and so on. 
But the problem with that is that they went too far with it. The idea that Eric Bischoff came up with is like, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and take the NWO faction. We're going to go ahead and have that separate out as a completely new promotion aside from WCW. And so you have WCW wrestlers and their own storylines and all stuff, and we'll have NWO, and that's going to be its own wrestling faction. The one and only time that the NWO got its own dedicated like pay-per-view event to try this idea out you're going to have to look this one up, Sarah, because you're going to... Actually, I you know, believe I, I did. It's but. called NWO Sold Out. S-O-U-L-E-D Out. January 1997. And hang on a minute. I'm going to have to do something with that. Yeah, yeah. Go, just shenanigans went down with a computer. Sorry well, about that. Not just shenanigans. Yeah. No, just putting it simply, that idea was a godless mess. The entire program was overbloated with really weird decisions creatively and production wise they had a live dj who was saying some really like dumb almost racist shit during the show let's just say that during the, the, push, match. the push for controversy became too big and the idea of pursuing more and more controversy began to break into boundaries that would make even the most dedicated fan go bruh Bro, what the fuck, man? Brass. Brass. <laughs> okay. Stop. They had this interesting little idea of, oh, hey, we're going to pick, uh, we're going to have a Miss NWO beauty pageant contest yeah. during the show. So you'd think like, okay, these guys are like the badasses, the renegades. They're going to have these gorgeous uh, models or like these like pinup girls or like cheerleaders from the local like university. Or no, they get like the most haggard looking bitches in the local area. And I'm not saying that in like like a, 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 like to be that insulting. Was the video you sent me. Oh, huh? I know you're no, not. Like, I'm saying like these ladies were fraught to into uh, the eyes. It was not easy. And so you had like Let us say that women, they were not like, feeding the normal models of what is considered conventional beauty up on today's time. Those bitches were ugly as they shit. Were u- it, it was, I'm and not, you said it, not us. And like, You're thinking it too. And <laughs> like they don't even have like a proper contest for it or whatever. They have like this weird thing like, oh, you have you 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 have like six or seven of these women lined up. You ask them like – they had the, this one dude who was trying to act like freaking Howard Stern, but he looked like – well, let's face it. If you th- look up 90s douchebag – on Google, and you get this pit image of this punchy, a punchy looking dude with short spiked hair and sporty sunglasses and a bad leather jacket. That's basically this guy in yeah. human form. Yeah, this punchy fucking dude. He was like, like interviewing these ladies who I swear they pulled out of the local biker bar, and like, okay, so what would you do to Hulk Hogan to be part of the NWO? And they would give like these bland answers. It was so dumb. It and, was dumb. Okay, like that's that's just one part of it. Another Unfor- part was yeah. the way that they were booking the matches themselves, the yeah. actual wrestling matches. The sold out, yeah, the sold out pay per view was just Bas- was basically designed to have every one of the bad guys in the NWO win in like the most cheap and like like underhanded way possible. It was the first, but time they were so cool because they're the bad guys. <laughs> that, was actually, that was actually one of the first times where. Me, funny thing is, this is one of the first time we saw one of the first cases of subverting expectations gone hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I know you hate that term. Oh, no, I know you hate way, that term with a fire passion. How much people pay for this again? There was money that was paid. How much <laughs> was money do you, you have to pay to be in this event just to see this cataclysmic trash bag of a show? Joseph, they, they, like, they certainly sold out the arena and they got their pay-per-view buy rates, but man, that show was horrible. <sighs> Get ready. Unfortunately, this, this feeling of this disappointment only will repeat be- itself. Unfortunately, like, this is only the beginning there, of there was, WCW's there was downfall. Some, there was some yeah. interesting ideas in it. They had like a they, they had like uh like in terms of production wise, they had a flyby camera uh zip lining across to from one side of the ring to the other, which looked nice. It's a nice production value. Um, there was one, uh, there was another one that was sort of wrong looking. They had a fish the eye camera, cannibal. like a fish eye lens up on the top of one of the poles of the ring of the, no. the ring post and that camera and it was like looked so grungy and so filthy but when the guys are like making moves in front of the fisheye camera it looks i guess they were trying to make it look cool and edgy and shit I'm like <laughs> swing and a miss brother swing and a fucking course, miss what do you mean miss they were aiming at the wall there was no wall exactly. they were inside of wrestling oh they god just kept missing all right. Unfortunately, between then and the year 2000, they were on a steady decline, and there were many factors. 
that contributed to the downfall of WCW. Now get ready, because what follows now is nothing more than a cloud, a hazy admiral of pure disappointment. Say hi to him. Hi, Sean. Hey, Sean. Hi. <laughs> anyway, He's like, what follows <laughs> now, aside from his dangling ball sock in our screen, Dude, is a cloud Angel. of Angel, what the disappointment, fuck, man? the likes of which you will never see again. All right. So get ready, because this is going to hurt more than every case of blue balls you have ever experienced in your life. All right, okay. let, me, let me get back on it here. So, so yes. The NWO did turn to success for WCW and Turner executives. That cannot be disputed. However, they failed to follow up on that revolution, and they failed to create new stars for WCW. They kept putting over the same people over and over, apart from the rise of Bill Goldberg and his undefeated streak. There were no other new stars that were created. And there were several factors that have led to the downfall of WCW between 1997 and 2000. I, and I can sum it all up without going to de- Well, Juan can go into detail if he wants, but I can sum it up with these facts. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into detail. I'm Fact gonna... number one, oh, uh, the overspending, the amount of money that WCW basically ponied oh, up boy. on a lot of expenses that weren't necessary and did not help the product. Mm-hmm. It, it 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 was a disaster. Like they bas- like like I mentioned earlier, since Eric Bischoff got big on the head, he was using the 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 funds that Ted Turner would sign off on blankly without any sort of issue to try to get so many weird gimmicks on there. There was uh 1996 was also the year of uh, WCW Uncensored, where they had a triple level steel cage match, which I gotta tell you, like I, like I don't know how much you know about like the cost of those kind of things, but having one 20 foot high steel cage surrounding the outside of the ring followed by a 15 foot high steel cage on top of it followed by another smaller 15 foot high steel cage <laughs> on top of that I gotta tell you that's that, that's that's not gonna that, you ain't gonna find that in no discount bin but that shit's expensive told, what if I told you I activated two iron cages <laughs> how about no it was like there was a lot of production value a lot of craziness trap. They were signing a lot of the older folks from the who were stepping out of the WWF, and not so much that they weren't um, making new stars, but that they weren't emphasizing the younger talents. You did have uh, Mexican luchadors jump in. You did have uh, new uh, cruiserweights who were jumping in as well. You had folks like uh, Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, Petty, uh, Perry Saturn, Juventud Guerrero, Super Crazy, Rey Mysterio Jr. You had. All these lightweights, these technical wrestlers, you know, they're they're either Canadian or Mexican wrestlers. Um, you have Lance Storm, who had a nice little uh, stint in WCW. Booker he, T, who had captured the WCW yeah, championship. Booker T was uh, was coming in along with his uh, brother Stevie Ray. They were Harlem Heat, and oh, they had made they made tag team history. They had singles runs, and like you said, Booker T, he became a United States champion, and he will never ever let you forget that he has been. A five time, 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 world heavyweight champion. How many times again? Five times. Oh, okay, cool. Four times. He will. God damn it. <laughs> Go on. But didn't they spend a lot on their salaries too? Isn't that what hurt them? Yes, yes they every- did. You you bring up a very good point. A lot of these guys, every a lot of these uh, wrestlers were signed to guaranteed contracts, meaning that even if they weren't required to show up at any specific show they were getting paid like crazy their travel was paid for which on the one hand yeah that's good and that's you know you don't want these guys paying out of pocket but they were insisted on being flown everywhere so that's just expensive that piles up especially for the bigger guys who they must have either a private jet or, or first class charter kind of thing and you know you could just get a car no i want something bigger and better that tells around the size of my dick uh, we can get you on a big luxury tour bus. No, I do not want to be you anywhere near the ground. I am too important to touch dirt with my glorious wrestling feet. I want my dick to have wings. So you want to fly? I want to fly! <laughs> Pretty much. And he did. It, it was fact, terrible. they all did. That was the problem. Uh, yeah. No, you're right about that. Their, their travel expenses was exorbitant. And the the uh, bigger stars uh, were demanding and insisting and somehow receiving this gigantic luxury treatment what else was uh, was uh, was another measure another factor in the downfall here is a bringing in celebrity guests that didn't help the product such <laughs> as they brought in will sasso from matt tv they brought in master p and the no limit soldiers when they were feuding with uh, the 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 country redneck band that was headed by oh Kirk. yes they brought in dennis rodman 
who was uh. one, who was part of the New World Order. They brought in yeah, the, the they Dennis, brought in Kiss. The, yeah, they brought in the rock band Kiss for uh, in order for them. I kid you not to play a free concert on free television, followed by having some random dude. Um, wh- what was his name? The uh, Kiss Demon. Yeah, the ki- they created yeah. a wrestler and called him the Kiss Demon. Uh, That's right. His real his real name was Dale Torborg, and by the time Kiss's like limited contract expired with WCW, they still called him the Kiss Demon. Guess and how much Kiss was paid for the performance? How much? Dale. Half a million dollars. Jesus. Fuck Christ. that man. <laughs> Please take into account, even but by then, then it's that kids. was quite a... Yeah, you have to be fair, it's Kiss. This is back when they were on the purest height of their of their fame. They were the big shots. So, yeah, I could see them demanding a half a million dollars, and I could see somebody pulling out that much... Ca- I mean, shit, dude. If you had a chance to get Kiss to celebrate your famous event, wouldn't you take that chance? Another example of... I guess so. Another example of WCW and TNT not... Ha- not Don't forget ha- the ICP. And the I- <laughs> and oh, the yeah, insane clown, clown posse. posse. Wait, Thank what you. the fuck? Oh, I, did ooh, they I didn't know that. They demanded something. They demanded something, all right. Half of them actually threw themselves in to do hardcore, crazy matches. Good. Uh, and, and the funny thing is that WCW wasn't the only place they wrestled. They were in for like five minutes in the WWF, and it was terrible because it was uh. made no sense. But WCW <laughs> didn't give a fuck. Well, so he, they gave all no, the cash. That's all they needed, except for one member of the band. He just what? wanted a doctorate explanation followed by a three-hour presentation of how the fuck the magnets actually work. <laughs> Ah, fuck the it. question eludes him even today. The man has to be It's been t- over 20 years. He's still... And, and who is it? Violet J? The, that, that's the one? Nice. Thank curious J. He curious, just wants to know. Jay, yeah. Oh, now he's just... <laughs> Another example of uh, the financial mismanagement of WCW and TNT was basically hotshot booking their matches free on national television. Big five-star matches that you could see on pay-per-views that would uh, that would uh, guarantee you ticket sales and pay-per-view buy rates, but they air for free on national television. And get this: the WCW Road Wild pay-per-view that they had from 1996 to 1999 at the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally over in South Dakota, zero t- zero ticket sales. It was a free event. Oof. What? I I heard that. Think about how many. Think about how many oh my people God. Were in that didn't have to pay a dime. So literally, just walk in. Yes, and this was back then when pay per views were selling, were uh, where pay per views were selling out. Okay, what could possibly bring forth this culture? Why would you do something to actively not make money? Mm, it's called ego. You have to understand one of the things that Eric Bischoff has been accused of over the years, which I'm seeing here that like, like in his older age he's mellowed out of. I guess because he's not in like professional wrestling, he's not actively trying to make himself look like a cool kid. Is that? He's basically hiring these big time WCW stars and hiring these guys in the NWO and getting himself le- uh, like brought up on television in b- a bunch of motorcycle gear, in a bunch of leather jackets, and re dyeing his hair black year after year because his 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 gr- roots were starting to show is because he's had the worst midlife crisis in the history of the world. And he had the access to Ted Turner's bankroll in order to in order to try to soothe it. So he fucking had this Road Wild pay-per-view shit for three years in a row because Jesus. he couldn't handle the fact that he was graying. For Christ's sake, I'm graying. I'm the, I don't complain about it anymore, but I don't fucking try to burn all my cash on a goddamn motorcycle rally and try to people to come and cheer it on because I want people to love me. Can you imagine Fuck, Eric. What the hell, man? Can you imagine the man getting up in the morning, looking at the mirror, and just thinking to himself, maybe there's more to life than this. And then turning around and going, no! (laughs) (laughs) Into the distance, screaming. It was was beautiful. It was so ridiculous. I don't don't understand, man. Here's another factor that played into the demise is horrible booking decisions on TV and in pay-per-views. You mentioned that? Yes. And I've already talked about that. There were also poor executive decisions made by WCW management and Turner Network executives that killed the product. Something that actually came to light recently was, uh, as you can probably imagine, other executives from uh, the Turner Broadcast Network and uh, Turner Network Television, they really, really, really didn't like WCW. Namely yeah. because they fi- saw it as lowbrow television. They saw it as crap. They saw it as uh, as uh, like T- Ted Turner's pet project. Like, oh, this old guy, he's trying to relive his glory days from when he was a kid and loved pro wrestling. What's yeah. wrong so, with that, Bill? 
No, well, there's nothing wrong with that, but except for the fact that WCW's like prime time television slots was taking away from all these momentous opportunities for uh, them to air like RoboCop three. Yeah, for example. Yes, God. I kid you not. No, they brought RoboCop in on I, a pay per view, and I it was so ridiculous. Rem- I actually remember oh what exact debate you're talking about. <laughs> By the way, please take into account that one thing people keep forgetting about cable television in general is that the fight for the proper prime slots is so cutthroat, it makes gang wars look like playground scores. Yeah. Companies will tear each other apart just to be at the right time, at the right place to get as many mm-hmm. as possible. And when you combine that with the fact that the people in suits upstairs don't know or don't care about what the people in suits downstairs want, and we got a bit of a left hand, right hand, trying to jerk each other off here, but it's not working because what? nobody can find it. It's a huge, stupid mess, no matter which direction you're pointing it. Which is one of the reasons why it has come to light in recent years that in the waning years of WCW, there were other Turner uh, uh, executives who were trying to take the expenses and the losses in their products and their projects for different TV shows and different promotions and stuff under the Turner channel. And they were taking all of those financial losses and dumping it into WCW's ledgers with no one noticing. Were we mistaken? No. The WCW must be wrong instead. They were pretty much. They were actively trying like crazy to devalue the monetary like like gains that WCW had gotten by making it look like it lost millions of dollars more than it actually ever made. So that's some underhanded bullshit on top of that. And like Jose was mentioning that there were that the the, the actual heads of WCW didn't know, you know, their left from right hand and they were fucking like making decisions where they were airing television matches where you had these big high stakes like matches where you could milk pay-per-view buys like nobody's business but they're putting it on free TV. Shall I mention that one match? Do it. Go right ahead. I want to feel this moment. Sarah, my dear, what do you know about the finger poke of doom? Oh, I I don't know anything about it. <laughs> oh, you're going to oh, love yeah. this. Now, please take you're... into account, these events are announced weeks ahead, hype up the fans, and thousands of fans come and they're expecting a show. When they roll up to the ticket booth and pay their big fat stacks of hard-earned cash, they are expecting a show. They want violence. They want trash talk. They want dudes tossing each other with so much force they sink the continental plates. We want to see actual good old-fashioned stylized oh. beatdowns. Hang Ex- on, Juan Except in it. this one, in this one particular match, this one particular event was literally announced on the night. It was announced the day of. The, uh, the, 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 uh, this match happened on free TV, WCW Monday Nitro. Uh, at this point, it was what, 1999? The beginning of 1999. They were fresh out of Starcade. Yep. Um, what do you call it? Hulk Hogan had, at the end, at the tail end of 1998, said that he was stepping away from professional wrestling. He was retiring. Mm-hmm. And at this point, Bill Goldberg had just lost his WCW World Heavyweight Championship. He his infamous streak where he beat people back to back to back and it was amazing quick crazy matches was beaten by Kevin Nash in and Kevin Nash had uh, had been taking his uh, remnants of the NWO uh, renamed it the Wolf Pack and these uh, and he was they were they were pretty much cheered on like this was like a good guy faction now and he and he he was trying like crazy to like say okay well Bill Goldberg He's not worthy of uh, of of uh, of uh, taking on the uh, the WCW champion. I want Hulk Hogan in the ring. I, he's saying that he's retiring, but I'm saying that he's up to uh, some sort of tricks. He's up to no good, and I want to take him down in front of everyone tonight. And I'll put my WCW championship on the line. Hulk Hogan strolls up in quote unquote street clothes, which is basically uh, black. You know, jeans, black sort of jeans, like mine, black shirt. like a black T-shirt, his do rag, his like bandana, and he had his hands taped up. And this was like a colossal match. They actually got, I shit you not, uh, w- uh, Michael Buffer, the let's get ready to rumble guy, to announce these two men into the ring. That was the main event of the night, right? Yeah, it was the main event of the night. And Kevin Nash was coming in with like the most elaborate pyro you could imagine, another testament of the <laughs> exorbitant money burning that WCW was, uh, uh, was uh, exercising at that time. And you see these two colossal guys stare down, and they were stare, mean mugging each other. There were sparks it, fly. There was a fucking Dragon Ball Z aura building. It was crazy. 
And it was absolutely wild. Hulk Hogan came up to Kevin Nash's face. Kevin Nash shoved Hogan into the corner of the ring. The match is getting started. Hogan's like caught off his uh, off guard. He takes one step forward. He looks like he's about to throw a mean right punch to Kevin Nash's face. And while everyone was cheering and freaking out, he pull, pulls back and he simply pokes Kevin Nash in the chest. Oh, no. Nash drops. He flapjacks oh. like a goddamn pancake. Hogan pins him. The one, two, referee three, has three, to count it, and that's it. No, no, no. Imagine combing all this and way. And the new world order is back, baby. Yeah. Imagine oh, combing oh. all this way, building up all this hype, and then being left at half mast, just <laughs> dick in hand, waiting for the stroke, and nothing happens. The finger Take all that money. So long. Oh, hold on. What's up? What's up, Sarah? I just said paint all that money for yeah, that. Nothing. Yeah, for a big fat nothing. But it gets worse. It gets worse. Of course it this does. This entire time throughout that broadcast, it was pushed that Bill Goldberg was being uh, held by the police because he quote unquote uh, was doing like being like harassing to uh, Miss Elizabeth, who is the wife of Randy Savage. And like, oh, no, like after they get that cleared up. Bill Goldberg ran ransacked back into the uh, arena only to get electrocuted by Scott Hall <laughs> with a cattle prod, which was smoking for some reason. I don't know why. I don't think cattle prods do that. He just cranked that shit he up got so his hard, ass whipped. he reacted with his sweat. He got his ass whipped in front of everyone, and, they, and the NWO had been reformed and reborn, and they spray paint Bill Goldberg's bald freaking head. They <laughs> tagged his back with NWO for life just to embarrass the guy like, <sighs> this was like number one. Obviously, it's 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 the worst sort of reheating rehash shock the world for the sake of its own shockiness booking idea you could ever come up with. But if you wanted to go that route, obviously ain't nobody gonna stop you. But could you at least put it on that goddamn pay per view so you can make get the thirty nine ninety five for the pay per view buys? Because people would have gone bananas and you could have built that up. But no, they didn't fucking believe enough in that. Between hotshot booking, unceremoniously ending Goldberg's undefeated streak at Starcade, and the finger poke of doom, these are just some. Ter uh, these are just a few examples of the horrible booking decisions by WCW. And it should be important to note that on the same time of January 1999, they so famously spoiled that mankind would win the WWF Championship, which caused them to lose royally. In the Monday Night War ratings. So wait, they, they just like, dropped it like that? They, like It's literally like WWF's Monday Night Raw was being pre-taped on and off. And on one of those pre-tapes, somebody from WCW found out that Mick Foley, the hardcore legend who was wrestling as Mankind on that night's episode of Nitro on Raw, he was going to uh, win the WWF Championship. And they announced it on air on Nitro. It's like, oh, yeah, that'll put butts in seats. Oh, so if, you, if you're if you worried about checking out that show, don't bother. Here's the ending. Here's what's going to happen. But wait till you see what happens tonight, folks. You're not going to want to miss it. Oh. And then we get that, that sack of trash. You're cringing. I can see that right now, Sarah. You are just like cringing in horror from this not only is that like bad form and bad sportsmanship but it's just such a a cheap and dirty move like what the fuck yeah. you don't do that but i guess yeah, when it comes did. to yeah they did and it cost them because when that happened everyone who was watching um, a wcw turned to watch the wwf to watch mick foley win and yeah. that fucking bit them in the ass in the worst way see it all went downhill from there see Betraying your audience's expectations, that happened. And depending on direction, writing, power, persuasion, and the charisma of the actor, it can be done very well. You can anger your audience. You can make your audience laugh. You can please your audience. But the moment you disappoint your audience, <laughs> you are never going to recover from that one. Never. Yeah. Because that impression sticks in mind. The fact that you ask for so much and deliver... I think there was a quote for this in Final Fantasy X... You come to me demanding a chicken, a, a phoenix, but you offer me chicken feed. Nice. If you do that, th the audience will never trust you again because now they know their money is not safe. They know their trust is not safe. They know they could spend the time, the effort, and the cash to go to their favorite show and their favorite sport and receive a slap in the face for their troubles. Not even a good yeah. slap, a weak slap with a limp wrist. Right, right. right. Like it's, not even, it's, it's more insulting to you that they slapped you with such a piddly... The psychological damage will like last forever. <laughs> 1999 and 2000 would be the absolute lowest disastrous point for WCW. After that, 
They and then weren't comes winning. Vince, and then came Vince Russo, who fucked Michael, everything you forever. You said 1999. 1999, the year 2000. Their ticket sales were were low. Were going low. Their pay per view buy rates were. Angel, gone. are you trying to bite your tongue? Nobody's watching Mon- uh, Monday Nitro at that old. point. It was in dire disaster. The, another one of the executive decisions, as Juan mentioned, was hiring Vince Russo, who used to write storylines for World Wrestling Federation. And the problem with that was that Vince Russo had his own problems. Uh, uh, they just just look him up, and you'll see what his freaking problems are. Uh, he did not know what how to fucking write proper professional wrestling storylines. He ripped stuff off of Jerry Springer. He ripped stuff off of bad soap opera writing. Oh boy, time to start shit. No, like for example, he was the one who famously wrote that. Uh, uh, was it uh, Terry Runnels? Had a miscarriage because she got knocked over the ring. He did the same thing with Stacy Keebler in WCW that she was pregnant with someone's guy and uh, that she got knocked over and had a miscarriage. Why? Because that. Oh, it gets worse. He also had whose uh, grandmother on a pole? Who was it? It was Buff Bagwell. Buff Bagwell's. You gotta bring the grandma. Buff here. Bagwell's mm. grandmother. At New Blood Rising in two thousand. Yeah, the, 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 he had gimmicks on a pole. He had bottles of Viagra on a pole match. <laughs> He had, oh, hey, let's get the Partridge brothers, uh, the Partridge family to show up. Oh, they're expensive? Oh, it's okay. We'll just put other people in, in wigs, bro, and we'll just buy a Partridge family f- uh, van, bro. Let's just have that in here, bro. They were and losing. There was, yeah. there was cheap moves where he would insult uh, WWF uh, announcer Jim Ross, who had recently suffered a, 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 a seizure from be- having Bell's palsy. So half of his face got, actually got paralyzed, and in order to – uh, like rub salt on that wound. Uh, Vince Russo had his uh, writing partner Ed Ferrara show up as a caricature, uh, calling him Oklahoma, where he would talk out of one side of his mouth, making bad jokes about like Oklahoma uh, football and barbecue, and having him drool and and drool off the side of his face yeah. to make fun of Jim Ross because it was terrible. apparently that somehow added to professional wrestling. The inner nope. machinations oh, of yeah. their minds are an enigma. To understand Jim- their brains, you must acquire a taste for free-form jazz. Like, you don't insult <laughs> Jim Ross. He is one of the best. The best. Uh, like, one of the best figure names name. in professional wrestling. Actually, After he left WCW and went to work for WWF, he not only served as one of the, as the best play-by-play commentator, but he actually talked Vince and the other executives to sign off disgruntled WCW stars over to WWF. Which is how they got gentlemen like, oh, I don't know, Mick Foley... Um, Stone Cold Steve Austin. The demands for beer increased exponentially after that game. L- and they made him into megastars. Uh, but like you mentioned here, as Angel would famously say, never attribute to malice to uh, stupidity can explain. Occam's razor is a beautiful thing. Yeah. The, 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 that, the, uh, the crap that Vince Russo was doing in terms of creative production, um, the excessive spending from WCW executives, the uninspired uh, matches that they were putting on, all this basically wound up snowballing in 2001, which was the year that WCW ended up closing its doors forever after it got bought out by Vince McMahon and the WWF for what's the amount now? Like, because it, it, it had was, been disputed yeah. for years. Yeah, the last I checked, like at first it was disputed to be the sum of 4.1 million dollars, and I actually did more research. Apparently, uh, one of the wrestling figure uh, figure legends, Jim Cornette, clarified that it was sold for a sum of two million dollars for their intellectual property Me- two million like, you have to understand that that means that they bought the contracts to almost every wcw wrestler for pennies on the dollar they yeah. bought the intellectual yes. properties the video library for every program they've ever put out they took everything they basically. took everything and they paid two million dollars out of pocket which is like pp money Compa- compared like to compared this. to the sheer amount of inherent value those artists i just realized something fellows what look up Spending, bad decisions, constant trust that the public will back them up no matter what, repeated mm-hmm. by more bad decisions and spending. I do believe that we are seeing what seems to be one of the first publicly known cases of too big to fail. It was banging so hard and it was doing so much money that they forgot what made them so famous in the first place and they started to take reckless measures under the belief that no matter how many mistakes they would make, willing, deliberate, deliberate or otherwise, they would always have enough or produce enough cash that they could just fall back right to the way they were before. And I feel that may have been one of the cases that caused them to be unable to adapt with the change in times. Now, this is the crazy part because a lot of this, it didn't just happen overnight. Oh, no, this was gradual, wasn't it? Like, 2001 saw 
that uh, the Turner Broadcast Network, like TBS and TNT, they became part of AOL Time Warner. And the AOL Time Warner merger that brought it all in basically was it meant that Ted Turner was no longer in control of his own TV stations now. Mm-hmm. And it, when the higher-ups looked at the expenses of WCW, when they saw the, how much money it wasn't making, they basically said, like, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're, we're not going to have this crap on our television anymore. Even if you manage to make it solvent again, we don't want this toxic uh, IP of World Championship Wrestling on our property listing anymore. There was a point where Eric Bischoff himself had actually come up with a conglomerate of different investors and different uh, promoters, and he came up with more than the $2.8 million that McMahon paid for. He actually wound up coming up with enough capital to buy out the WCW contracts, to actually reown it, and to try and put it out. But the fact of the matter remained, AOL Time Warner didn't want to put it on television, meaning it was practically worthless. If you can't air the programming and generate revenue from that with the ad revenue and promoting the pro, uh, the, the the promotion from there, it had no value. They had a bigger offer from Eric Bischoff and his group and from other pro, uh, motions to buy WCW out, but they sold it to Vince McMahon because fuck them. It's literally yeah. just like we the don't want it. We don't want this. Will powerful. <laughs> yeah. No. And yeah, the swift purchase of WCW. And yes, there's a lot of backstory behind that. Um, depend like uh, there's a lot of information depending on who's telling the story. Who's telling the story? And I've sent you some a video, uh, some video on that. On that, yes. Message. But did they push it to be more family friendly? Wasn't that a problem? They were As trying we- to. They failed miserably. It was what in 1999 they went to that 1998 oh. before they hired Vince Russo. They were trying to push to a family friendly format. They were trying, and to- I thought I was thinking that was an issue too. Like it was a misfire on their end. It's like they, they were they went one way with hardcore and hard and hard edged and edgy and raunchy and and uh, realistic stuff to combat uh, to compete with the WWF at the early time, who was still more the family friendly and the fam- family oriented, friendlier, colorful entertainment. But once 1998 uh, started rolling in and the WWF was going into what's been famously called the Attitude Era where they were also matching them one for one with, you know, having harder storylines with having more realistic and more violent storylines going on. WCW couldn't keep up. They just couldn't. What winds up coming down with it is that World Championship Wrestling was set up as you have Ted Turner was the owner of a TV company that produced professional wrestling. Vince McMahon was the owner of a professional wrestling company that produced TV content. That mentality and that sort of and that sort and that sort of uh uh like that sort of uh what's the term I'm looking for? Um the, the, that sort of mentality when it comes to how they approach putting their uh promotions out was what gave Vince McMahon the edge at, at, at while these uh Monday night ratings wars went on. Um, in which is what wound up ca- like getting the WWF uh, set up for public trading in 1999. They went, they went public. They got, uh, they they wound up ballooning up to a billion dollars in investment. Jesus oh, yeah. Christ! And it went crazy from there. That's why you know Ted Turner and WCW they couldn't continue from that. You can't financially. stop us. There's too much money involved. Yeah, and before yeah, and before I go ahead and jump ahead to the 21st century in 2018. Um, any uh any final thoughts on the decline of WCW and Turner executives for wanting to get rid of it? They were assholes, but they weren't wrong. That's the only thing I could say about that. Yeah, that feels like the correct amount. They weren't exactly right about saying it, but they weren't exactly wrong in what they were doing or why. And what about the like? What about the swift purchase? Like that's something to note about. Like, do you really think that there was like an inside job? What do you Basically, think, Sarah? There seems to be some some mm. like scheming on both sides on that one. How about you? Sarah. Yeah, I mean, they were assholes about it, definitely, but I understand why they did what they did. So like They were pushing for their own content. They were pushing for their own uh, projects to be made on television. But it really, but the way that they sort of like kicked the dog when it came to WCW was yeah. underhanded. Yeah. But that's the corporate world. I, exactly, I guess that's it, the corporate world. That is. And shit was crazy. Like Angel said, if you think that it's hard trying to put content out on social media, on YouTube, and on Netflix and stuff, imagine how bad it was back then, back in the day when you had to produce 
physical copies and physical uh, you know, like results when it came to broadcast television. It was a godless mess. It was. But, of course, that was back then. Fast forward and had a time into the summer of 2018. Which is wildly, like, from that entire time, TBS and TNT had no professional wrestling content in it whatsoever. Yep. It, like, and, of course, they went on their own. They, if, if people like it. They got to their we know drama sort of mantra. Mm-hmm. So they have so they have sitcoms. They have uh, 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 dramatic programming on there. Lots of reruns. Lots of reruns. Of reruns. Like, like, let's not fucking reruns. lie. Like TNT oh, okay. makes its bread and butter on reruns of shit. Yeah. Yeah. It was like the second hand market but for TV shows. But, but fast forwarding to September 1st of 2018 where there was a group of wrestlers who were part of a certain club that was very famous in the world of professional wrestling. I believe they were known as the Bullet Club. They were known as the Bullet Club. <laughs> that, which, are, uh, which was an interprofessional wrestling group uh, operating out of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, they were basically all the gaijin, the American wrestlers or you know the foreign wrestlers who came to wrestle in Japan. Uh, this cr- faction uh, at the current incarnation consisted of Nick and Matt Jackson, known as the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, uh, and the American Nightmare, Cody Rhodes. As you you may imagine, he was the son of the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. So, of course, he took his name and turned it around so he could sound more nefarious. Yes. Um, And the Virgil to his Dante. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the, it, no more, the, no more like the 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 Virgil to his Sparta. The oh, Virgil like, to his Sparta. That's right. Because Dusty Rhodes is his dad. Yeah. So, forgot. so in 2018, um, like the 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 investment in independent professional wrestling had been skyrocketing. The internet has been spreading like crazy. These promotions like New Japan Pro Wrestling had pay per view access to uh, the United States. They were promoting these. Uh, the wrestlers were promoting themselves directly, like through uh, channels like Hot Topic. They put their freaking T-shirts out on there, and it sold like nobody's business. They got set up with uh, with uh, OneHourTees.com, uh, and they now have like a permanent branch for their merchandising independently from there. Which was all well and good until who was the one who issued the challenge? Wasn't I think it, it was Dave, Dave Meltzer from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Dave Meltzer, he's basically the godfather of wrestling journalism. He basically said, like, oh, this is all well and good that these that these guys, the Young Bucks and that uh, the Bullet Club are selling all this merchandise without the machine of the WWE uh, like behind them. But there is no way that these guys can sell out a 10,000-seat stadium in the U.S., like they're making great shows in Japan, they're making great shows uh, abroad, but there's no way they could do that. What was Cody's response? Oh boy, here we go. Challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. <laughs> On September first, they uh, the the, uh, the Bullet Club hosted their very first independent wrestling pay per view called All In, which is a, which was sold out 10,000 seats over at the All State. I think it was at the All State Arena, Arena in, in Chicago. Chicago, Illinois. They sold out their tickets. It was it uh, 28 minutes and 54 seconds. Yes, <laughs> it, they sold out the entire thing, and folks were like losing their minds. Like, wait a minute, what? Where's all this uh, groundswell coming from? It was just an idle dare. We weren't actually being serious. And well, what if I do it anyway? What I do anyway. <laughs> and they decided to bring forth the powers of wrestling and masks and ropes. The, and Jesus! The pay-per-view was... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The it was, pay-per-view was a success. They it, brought... was, it was a resounding success. It was insane. They actually wound up selling out 10,000 seats. The entire arena was sold out. They didn't have to blanket off the uh, nosebleed section. People were sitting in the freaking nosebleeds. They didn't care. And they got to see wrestlers from Ring of Honor, from New Japan, from uh, uh, all sorts of like independent promotions all show up and all come to this big celebration of what independent wrestling can do. And that's when uh, C- uh, Cody and the Young Bucks came up with an idea like, hey, how about we do this but more? Like, what the fuck do you mean more? Look, we might actually be able to freaking put together an, a, a promotion here. What? Are you crazy? Look, this was a strike of light. Uh, this was lightning in a bottle. There is no way we could do it again. There is no possible way that we could reorganize this sort of fan base and get this sort of promotion. Five minutes later, what happened? On January 1st, 2019, <laughs> they announced a new promotion called All Elite Wrestling. They wound up partnering with Tony Khan, who is a co-owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, uh, alongside his father. Um, and with that sort of you know, like sports enthusiasm in mind, they based their office out of Jacksonville, Florida, just a quick three-hour drive north from where we are. And, and um, 
I think that, that, yeah, they hosted an outside uh, press rally or whatnot, like, and they signed some big names into all the wrestling, including one, Le Champion, the man who's been with the pro- in professional wrestling for 30 years, Jeez. Chris Jericho. Ah. I, I see you were, like, mouthing his he name over here. Titan? No, like, you, he may as well be. Like, I saw you were mouthing his name, Sarah. Like, you know, like, even you can appreciate the grandeur of Chris yeah. Jericho on here. <laughs> exactly. She's like smiling and, and not on this. Yeah. Like, we're audio. We can't see you here, you know. Yeah. It was it was it, it was it was an awesome announcement. Everybody lost their minds and they hosted their very first pay-per-view in Las Vegas, Nevada at the MGM Grand Arena called yes. Double or Nothing. Like a year after the All In pay-per-view, right? Almost. Yes, one year after. Like so so naturally they called it double or nothing like okay we're either going to get all elite wrestling to work or this is going to be uh, the biggest flop it hit. it worked it worked it was beautiful it, it was one of those cases of there's no way this can possibly succeed what do you mean it succeeds <laughs> but here's what caught the attention of Turner Media they were uh, apparently a couple of the executives from what I've read and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this they no. were invited to uh, participate to show up and watch the other pay-per-view, which is called AEW's Fight for the Fallen, it was a July summer pay-per-view that was held at the Daily's Place in Jacksonville, Florida, and all the money, all the proceeds were going to go to charity. So, so like the, uh, the Fight for the Fallen pay-per-view has been a staple for AEW since then, and what's uh, what and, and the fact that uh, AEW was deciding to have their um, have their work not only to the uh, like uh, send out to the benefit for their promotion but to actually f- have one dedicated event of the year to work for uh helping support retired wrestlers and helping support uh other charities as well that's right that caught the attention of turner media and they said hey hey guys money uh, would you like to be on our t- on our tv stations maybe oh money. so now you want pro wrestling on your stations <laughs> huh it's almost as if you motherfuckers who've just been airing reruns and stale dramas for almost 20 years need something with a live audience. Wait a goddamn second. It's are almost you tell, as if... Are you telling me that two decades of doing the exact same thing that is not working requires change? What a novel concept. Are you telling me that business... Oh, oh my gosh! ...changing times to maintain profits, otherwise they fall into stack... Are you shitting me, sir? I shit you not, good fellow. What kind of groundbreaking, extraordinary lack of... It's common sense, guys. It's common fucking sense. What is it with people getting dumber the richer they get? What's going on? Should they be the other way around because they can afford better education? Mm, I don't know. Maybe Something went wrong at some point, and I don't know where it is. And the point is, money rots the brain. Anyway. Yes, indeed. That's what I was thinking. And with no sense. My brain is shit, and I got no money. And with the partnership of Ollie Wrestling an and uh, Turner Media... AEW Dynamite uh, first aired on uh, on Wednesday, October second of twenty nineteen, just the- weeks after their uh, after their annual pay per view, which is now renamed All Out in so it- Chicago. Yeah. Oh ha ha! Ah, very cute. Ha ha ha! Sorry, I missed the joke. What? And All In, and now they named the, 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 the All In was the inaugural pay per view that started everything. So now every year they celebrate it and they call it All Out. As in, yeah, oh. we're going all out for all our okay. Promotion. Sorry, every time I use All In or Out, I just refer to my consumption of Thanksgiving dinner and the time I have to let it go. <laughs> but yeah, she rolls uh, her eyes because she knows I speak the truth. Do these not are the guys I call my friends and brothers. Friends, so, yes, I'm your family. Damn, He's that's why family. I said friends and brothers. Yes, I am the brother. He's the friend. Shut up. <laughs> October 2nd, 2019, AEW Dynamite airs on TNT. It should also be important to know that at the same time slot, we also have WWE NXT airing on national television at the USA Network. Which wow. which was uh, which is hysterical because that's what wound up inspiring Jose over here to have us have our weekly broadcast on Instagram calling it the Wednesday Night War. Yay! Initially, Jose, initially Jose was just doing a back-to-back re- recap of WWE's NXT show and their NXT UK programming. But with the advent of AEW Dynamite, he realized, oh shit, they're going to try to spark another ratings war. They're try- like, and the WWE is going to do this to spite AEW. Like, oh, how dare you? We're the freaking conglomerate here. We're the ones who are in charge. You can't stop. And every single week, almost... For the entirety of the past year, AEW all Elite has Wrestling been, has been beating the WWE in this in this Wednesday night rating slot. They've been dominating in viewership. They've been dominating in the eighteen to forty nine demographics, and they've uh, and they've done so well in over in over in over a year 
that as I mentioned earlier in the video in the podcast that they have won a contract extension with TNT to guarantee them to air Wednesday night a AW Dynamite until 2023. So what do you think is actually causing that? What what do you guys think? Because you know you guys know a lot more about this than I do. What factors do you think make one so much popular than the other? Because there has to be a reason. It's the support. It's the fan base that really does it. With when it comes to AEW, you have this very fervent and very vocal fan base of folks who are tired of the WWE treating us the way WCW treated its fans in the late nineties. You're gonna take our shit and you're going to like it, and there's really no nothing you can say or do about it. We'll treat you like dirt. The WWE in the last twenty years has stagnated in their development for programming. They've got they make plenty of money, but they really don't give that much of a voice to its fans. The Could last time that that happened was what in 2014 when Daniel Bryan in the WWE who wasn't even a factor when it came to like the the scene for becoming world heavyweight champion, he was like sh- shooed horned into the world champ the world championship picture and won the WWE World Heavyweight Championship at WrestleMania that year. That's right. It was a big moment because the fans were crazy about Daniel Bryan. They supported him. He was a big independent star. He was a big star in the WWE. And the only reason why he had to lose his championship was because his uh, neck injuries started catching up with him. So he had to retire and abdicate the title at that point. And when did he return? He returned, what, four years after? Four years 2018? after, 2018, WrestleMania and people, 34. And they just picked right up where he left off. And it was fucking beautiful. That was the last time I can remember hearing anything where you had fans supporting one specific guy saying, hey, we want to see this guy become champion. He's a great athlete. He's a great promo. He's a great personality. And that was the last time that they were listened to. We get spoon-fed shit ever since. It could also be argued that between 2000, this is just my hypothesis, between 2001 and 2019, the WWE were ran under post. Think about it. Who else were they competing with? Uh, what about TNA? Team? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. No. Do you what? Exactly. What you about, see, even what, about even what about Angel. Ring of Honor? Ring of, <laughs> Ring of what? See, it occurs to me that even though it was said in the future, the words echo into the past. What you put into the audience echoes back to you. So you're telling me that one side actually gave a shit about the fans, and that's the reason they managed to gather so much support. Yeah, pretty much. That's why at this like, and don't get me wrong, the fact that they're actually using the NXT promotion for this like Wednesday night war time slot fight. What does NXT stand for again? It's it's, it's, it's just NXT. It's just NXT. It's basically standing for next generation talent, the stars of tomorrow. The like basically everything, everyone that the that the WWE is training right now and who's or, or like the developmental stars, they either hire them from other promotions and like train them up so they can uh, perform on WWE television, or they train them from scratch. Uh, are coming in and they start off at NXT and uh, at, at once uh, once the WWE has decided that they've, they've developed well enough to be on the big rosters for Monday Night Raw or Friday Night SmackDown, then they go ahead and bring them up. Usually, this sounds like a good idea, except for the fact that Raw and SmackDown have suffered with bad creative decisions and bad booking and really shitty decisions. So, what, whenever we say, oh, hey, they got demoted to Monday Night Raw, it's not an exaggeration. It, like You had one guy, Finn Balor, who was the founder of the famous Bullet Club. He started at NXT. He went to Monday Night Raw. He became the very first WWE Universal Champion, which is like a big fucking deal. He was a world champion, he was, like, and they made a big deal of it. But... He lost it in the shittiest of circumstances. They didn't do anything with him in terms of any sort of interesting storylines. He had to forfeit the title due to injury. Ex- yeah, exactly. And and when they realize, oh, hey, we could probably use a ratings boost on our NXT uh, programming to help out. Let's take Finn Balor and bring him back. People like him. And it's working so far-ish. So far. Ish. Eh. It, they're, they're not winning, but people are still watching NXT more. And they like that Finn Balor is, uh, doesn't have to be shoehorned with bullshit. Well, here's my question in all this and everything that we've just discussed, everything that we've covered between uh, Turner Media's relationship with WCW back then during the 90s and their current relationship with all the wrestling right now. Mm -hmm. What has changed? Has anything changed at all? Like what? what Give me your thoughts, Sarah. I want to hear what what you think might have changed in in between uh, in in TNT's uh, mindset from the time they got rid of WCW to now. What do you think it is? Um, they seem to care about the fans more. 
I think you're right about that. They, they like you, these guys have they can't be stupid. They have to realize, oh hey, that you know AEW is a big fiery product, and there are people who want to watch this and they want to see more of it. Let's go ahead and sign that up, and we'll have the nice little history backing to it too. Oh hey, remember that TNT used to have wrestling? Well, we've got it again. Come check us out. Oh, but what about the time that you guys like? Nope, we've got it back on wrestling. Come watch our channel. But didn't you actively try to sabotage? No, never it? happened. Never <laughs> happened. I don't know what you speak of. These actions were known. I'm bleed the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth. What are those? The bullets are going to fire into your body if you keep asking me this question. <laughs> but yeah, I think you're right. Money. It's it, that they f- they wound up realizing that the fans of, of of AEW are fervent and fiery, and they'll watch no matter what. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah. think I think Sarah's right on this one. I think Sarah, yeah, I think you, uh, you had a good point too. Like it's it's important to note that back in the day, Ted Turner personally wanted to keep WCW despite all the other executives from Turner Media that didn't want to have it on, uh, premiere on uh, have it on national television. Like it was all Ted Turner, one hundred percent. The difference then to now is that the Turner executives who are watching the AEW product. They see what they're doing, and they notice the fans and how they're reacting and how they're supporting it. Like, so it's a big eye-opener for all of them. I think it's more to the point that they realize, oh, hey, this has a dedicated fan base. It's got its own revenue stream. For us, it's really just generating ad revenue, so we lose almost nothing by trying. So that's why they had them on that preliminary like one-year uh, c- uh, contract with TNT, and then they wound up extending it to 2023. It's like, okay, this shit works. Let's keep trying this shit more. You guys do your thing. We're not going to meddle with you. It's not as if they could really try because it wasn't a property of WCW. They don't have any financial responsibility to All Elite Wrestling. So and they d- that is why they're doing it. They have no financial responsibility. It's because their fingers are not all the way into the stickiest part of the pie. They're allowed to go, you know what? You can do what you're doing as long as the money keeps rolling in. I guarantee you, the only reason they can say this is because they know that at the moment, they cannot have any more control of the procedures. Exactly. I think you're right. It's both predictable and depressing how incredibly easy to see coming these people have become. Well, one thing for certain we can all agree with is that every, uh, all the fans are happy. Everyone's happy as long as they keep tuning in Wednesday nights to watch AEW and uh, smiles all around the world. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Um, I, I guess that covers everything for now. Um, let's go ahead and get final thoughts in. I'll start with Sarah. Um, your final thoughts on this entire little roundabout wheel and dilly adventure that we had here today. Uh, you don't take the fans for granted. You don't sit there and go, okay, we're going to build something up. Oh, just kidding. And expect their loyalty. <laughs> and expect them to stick with you. you. You don't do stuff like that. You you don't just take them for granted and expect them to stick with you no matter how much you fuck with them. You, you never do that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's more a message to AEW than it is to Turner. Uh, because, like, th- at this point, AEW has almost done everything right. Like, th- there's, of course, they've had their mistakes. They've had their controversies, like, recently. No race the, without stumbles, as they say. Uh, like, recently, the match between Matt Hardy and Sammy Guevara, where Matt Hardy, he... They, they both fell down from a, a scissor lift. They jumped off and fell into a table. But the way they fell, Matt Hardy's head hit the concrete, like flat backed on it. That and people, impact made me cringe so hard. And, and, and that caused people to freak out like, oh, my God, what is wrong with you people? Why are you continuing the match? Matt Life Hardy murder. Like Happy Matt Hardy was literally like, okay, I'm fine. Let's just finish this. I'll finish the match. Let's get the hell out of here. They cat scanned him. They checked him out. He's been... No, he hasn't been competing since that. Am I right, mm. Jose? That's, that's right. Um, the the results came back like he's all right, but they but they haven't medically cleared him to wrestle. So like AEW is actually taking good care of their wrestlers. They realize, oh shit, this was a mistake. We shouldn't have gone through and finished the match, but you know what? It's already done. Let's take care of him and actually take care of him after the fact. So they did right. So yeah, no, you're right. They sh- and they sh- as long as AEW continues with their proper booking that they've been working on, which is you know. It's weird because there's no like master plan for these uh, wrestlers. They're sort of going by sort of freeform jazz style and coming up with their storylines separately from everyone else. It's weird, but it's working. So it's yeah, too I crazy agree with to you. fail, so it won't. All right. Well, since you're you picking up, Angel, give me your final thoughts here. Well, my final. Th- First off, thank you both of you for giving me such an encouraging and educational course on how exactly this whole shenanigans went down with all of this. Next time, I'll pop a sticker. Uh, 
Okay. Microphone to the Come yeah, on. Next time, yeah, next time I'll confiscate your phone so you can uh, pay attention a little more. In my defense, <laughs> I was watching a recipe of bacon wrapped pork rinds, but he, I'll get to that later. Th- that's a good. Uh, that's a good recipe. I want. Though I did listen, and I thank you both for educating me on this matter. But if there's one thing I learned is that sometimes a single bad business decision can ruin your business. Disappointing your crowd can ruin your business, and a single injury, no matter how minor, can completely destroy your rising stars. So if there's one thing I learned from all this is. Don't ever assume that you are too big to fail, and don't ever assume that you are too important for the little problems in life to come knocking at your door. Smart, very smart. The, the ex- excellent words. Hopefully, I don't think it. Like, and for anyone who's been listening this whole time, thinking, "Oh, these guys are just jacking off AEW this whole time," and there's no, no, we weren't. No, we weren't. We weren't, we weren't jacking Dude, off AEW. We you. were. We were making mention of professional wrestling on TNT from both for both fronts from di- totally two yeah, no, different no. eras. Let's get one thing straight here. This is not shilling. We are not cutting promos for anyone. This was merely done for entertainment and educational purposes. Mm-hmm. No more, no less than that. Believe me, if I was getting paid by AEW to pr- to produce We'd this be episode, in merchandise right now. I this would be I show. would be rubbing that in everyone's face. <laughs> I would be like sending a freaking uh, a freaking AEW T-shirt to Sarah right now, and it would come by express delivery. This Angel would be receiving emails from TNT, having him come board as a part of their production crew. Dude, because they would have a cameo video of Chris <laughs> Jericho in the most bland and nonplussed manner, saying, "Oh, hey, Jose Casabona, I hear you're a fan of mine." I acknowledge your existence and just leaves you there. <laughs> <laughs> he would ride by on his golden limousine, say the lines and leave, All leaving right. behind a trail of broken <laughs> tears and thousand dollar bills. <laughs> All right. The, regardless. But, but no, regardless. Yeah, no, we're not shilling. We're just trying to give a educational and informational little storyline here. And th- th- let's get with Jose. Jose, give us your last thoughts here. All right. My last thoughts here. Like I am. I am actually proud with the direction that All Elite Wrestling is going with right now, especially with their partnership with TNT. Um, I think that they're actually doing things correctly right now. And, you know, when it comes to Cody Rhodes, and Cody and Cody's Cody's right now the public face of AEW, and he he hasn't let us down. And neither the, and not, none of the executive producers and uh, Tony Khan has not let us down yet. 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 Yeah. Never say never. Like you, you we've got to say like. Uh, Our confidence Aaron, has been the downfall. I know. Of Overconf- an empire yeah, I know. Before. I know. I know. I know. But so far, they're on the right track, and I just hope that they can continue, and that they can also learn from history, from the history of with WCW and how they went under with everything that they've been doing poorly in the in the late 90s well one of the things in the making happening like not right just now. from wcw but also from turner from, from, uh, from turner media uh, from, from both yeah like well that's that's why they're not allowing turner yeah. media to have any sort of financial stake in the company that's why yeah, they're not absolutely. allowing that because they realize the moment turner gets their hooks on aew that's, that's the right. end yeah absolutely like it's important to know that if you don't remember your history or if you forget your history you're doomed to repeat it Sad but true. You know, like all those TNT reboots and reviews and redones all over and over. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> all right, Juan, it's the uh, floor's on you, man. All right, well, um, all I could say is that this was a wild ride to go through. We had a nice little history lesson all around. Uh, I got some very odd expressions when we were mentioning shit to Sarah and to Angel, who are, I guess, we're, I guess Jose and I were giving you two a history lesson as we were live here. I'm going to put notes on my syllabus for my thesis when I graduate from this one. Yep, exactly, and um, I'm I'm just glad that we got to talk about this, and this came up in like a nice sort of like impartial fashion, kind of, because like mm-hmm. we we it's more it, this is like basic wrestling history that folks could appreciate that they can enjoy that they can learn something about, and of course, if you want more information on this stuff that we mentioned, go ahead and look it up for yourself. The information's out there; it's on YouTube. Plenty of other people have given more details about it. If you look up Jim Cornette, he is a living, walking, talking, very angry Kentuckian encyclopedia of wrestling knowledge. So he'll tell, he'll talk your ear off. He'll take an hour and a half to watch sixty minutes. So, like, if you want, if you want to research this stuff. It's here for you. We w- encourage you to learn because ciencia is potencia, right? Knowledge is power. Yeah. Yep. So I guess that's uh, I guess that's wrapping us up over here. I'm gonna, shall I go ahead and wrap us up? Go 
Go, go right ahead. Right. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much for listening in to this week's brand new edition of The Black Files. As we mentioned, please skip, uh, 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 share this podcast with all your friends. Be sure to comment on all our, stre- our uh, podcast platforms. Be sure to comment on our uh, video platform as well. And uh, we encourage you to subscribe to us to hit notifications because The Black Files will be returning very soon with more episodes. So we'll have stuff like this happening. Um, we may have other special guests that we might interview as well so i want to once again thank our friend sarah here uh is there anywhere where we can follow you sarah uh tiktok at it's sarah only and youtube at it's sarah only all right so yeah go ahead and follow her channels uh if I'm, uh, one of the last things that you put up was uh a nice takedown on doug walker we had you on and you brought that up and we sort of went bananas when that happened and uh so definitely follow our friend sarah and continue to follow us on Facebook.com slash the Ravens Flock, Twitter.com slash Ravens Flock 13, Instagram.com slash the Ravens Flock online, home of the Wednesday Night War, every Thursday evening at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Be sure, be sure to check out this podcast, The Black Files, here on Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and iTunes. Consider supporting the Ravens Flock on our Teespring store, Teespring.com slash stores slash the dash Ravens dash flock. Use our promo code FSHIP2020 for free shipping on all your items. Like, hit the notification bell, follow us, and subscribe to us on twitch.tv slash Ravensflock online and youtube.com slash Ravensflock. Home of the Black Files, Los Amigos play live every Saturday afternoon from 5.30 to 7 Eastern and the Ravensflock live from 7.30 Eastern and 9 p.m. Thank you very much for listening in to the Uncensored Interview and Review podcast of the Ravensflock. This has been the Black